what a game it was. Uh, 20 <laughs> goals to eight. Some would be disappointed by that, but uh, we're not because Geelong, as Kane said, one of the great performances you'll ever see, the way they won the prelim and the grand final. 81-point win, 35 points up at quarter time. They were ruthless in every sort of way, Kane. No doubt about it. Let's take a look at the last moments of this game and the celebrations because it was just on. They knew they'd had this one from, well, at least probably halfway through the second quarter. There's Joel Selwood. We'll get to him in a moment. Perhaps the greatest captain to ever play the game. What a relief it is when you hear the final siren of a grand final. How fun would it have been like that, that last oh, quarter? They, and they played like that. Everything they wanted to achieve in the last quarter. Selwood got a goal. Parfit came onto the ground, which was nice, and got a goal. De Koning kicked Jeremy his... Jeremy Cameron around the back. Jeremy Cameron kicked the goal yeah. from danger. If you're field. writing a script, everything, everything went happened. to the script yesterday for Geelong, didn't it? It was just brilliant. And then to see the coaching staff as well and the way that they've rejuvenated that and the good people they've got into the Cats and Tom Hawkins and Joel Selwood. And, and there it is, TJ. Do you, do you take from that reaction from Tom Hawkins and also Joel Selwood's parent and uh, mum and wife that it was curtains for him? Look, I, I did, TJ. And, and going into the season, and we'll talk about this as this uh, next two hours unfolds and, and even soon, but it was unsaid but believed to be the case that this was going to be Joel Sellers last year. We get to that last game of this season yesterday and he's too much of a team player though to want to make it about himself and, and whatever announcement's going to come in that space won't happen for I'd imagine the next fortnight or so. In past years everyone's wanted to say oh what about the home ground advantage Geelong get? Not this year because they could win anywhere, anytime. Look at this streak. The 16 wins in a row and that is as good as any side that's ever played the game uh, since Carlton in 1995. So you know, amazing. Brisbane 01, yeah, they got on Australia. Now we're 3 and 5 or. After like the, that. Uh, the, that, that famous yeah, game where Lee Matthews said if it bleeds, you can kill it, and that's when they went on that roll. And look at the sides Carlton 95, Richmond 2019, North 99, but right up there with uh, the best ever. Yeah, and I tell you what, uh, it was a, a rough old week for Gil McLaughlin in what is his sort of farewell lap, I guess, as CEO, with the situation in Hawthorne, which is still going to be played out, of course, and might be that way for another month or so. And then, of course, there was the grand final parade, which was diabolical from the river point of view. Once they hit land, it was fantastic. But the entertainment yesterday at the MCG which was bathed in sunshine in excess of 100,000 people and this man Robbie Williams, well that's Mike Brady of course, who should always be always. at the grand final by the way uh, singing what is the anthem but this man here just brought the stadium alive, well, let's have a little listen to this Now, I don't know about the halftime entertainment. I, maybe because I'm in my 50s and I don't know who these people are, but I, I have noticed on social media and the like the jury's out on the halftime entertainment. But in terms of Robbie Williams, I thought it was absolutely beautiful, his tribute to John Farnham. You guys were at the ground when everyone started singing You're the Voice. Yeah, it was mag magnificent. Couldn't have been better, Brownie. I, I just thought the way that they did it, 100,024 people yeah. in the house, full capacity, and it put on a great show. And his music suited the arena, didn't it? So he had yeah. some anthems. He obviously had the, the John Farnham song. And, and he brought the energy. He brought the energy. And uh, you pay the best in the world to be there and he delivered. Yeah, he certainly did. So as I say, overall I think Gil McLaughlin and the Commission and uh, everyone at the AFL would be sitting back this morning thinking to themselves, OK, let's give ourselves a tick for that. Yeah. And the debate will continue. It would have looked even better under lights, wouldn't it, with the fireworks and the, the light show that it, that it was, and well, that will be yeah, continued to be debated. I, I think because there is a bit of a hollow feeling at the end, isn't it? And I know we've had grand finals for more than a century being played during the day, but we are a nighttime world these days. All the major events are at night time, and it just seems to me that once the grand final's over, what, what do you put on? A Tom Cruise movie or what something? What about the like? celebrations, though? Like, Geelong enjoyed it and soaked it up longer mm. than any other team that I've ever seen. They didn't yeah. leave the ground for two hours. Yeah. And then they were in the rooms for another two hours. I left at maybe 8 o'clock wanting to see my brother. Their function was meant to start in Geelong at 9 o'clock. So if you have a night game, um, yeah. I suppose that's yeah. what's important. But I think for the people involved, the hundred of staff, the, the yep. supporters, yep. I think enjoying it at daytime and then letting everyone celebrate is, is nearly more important. Yeah. If, Take a look at some of the key players from yesterday and none more so than Isaac Smith who won the Norm Smith medal almost unanimously really. He got the four threes there. I think Jonathan Brown was the only voter that gave Patrick Dangerfield the three votes. Are, we, are you up. all in agreement yeah, with I th that I think, voting I think system? Yeah, I think they nailed it yeah. really. Oh, I wouldn't I have been upset if Patrick Dangerfield won the yep. I thought he was absolutely enormous. But Glad the Coney got a vote too, Kane. Yeah, 100% yes. he was terrific. But it was when the game was in the balance, the start, Isaac Smith was there. Eight possessions, a couple of goals in the first quarter. 
He had 14 score involvements on the day, and what a story it is. I mean, won the premierships at Hawthorne in the latest stage of his career, was identified for Geelong to play a role, and has done it exceptionally well. Great person, very popular teammate, mm. and a very, very worthy He's popular, yesterday. isn't he? he Everyone is. was happy that he won there. And uh, I believe that he thought he should have won one at Hawthorne as well. <laughs> yeah. He had 25 and kicked three. He felt like he was robbed that day. But uh, Isaac Smith, and he had, he had a very quiet prelim, uh, mm. but he was outstanding yeah. yesterday. Brownie, Chris Scott obviously started his coaching career in 2011. They won the flag that year. And uh, I think unfairly, it was almost considered the over hang of the Mark Thompson era. He had to go and do what he did. Now, his journey has been synonymous with that man he's hugging there, Joel Selwood. They, they had a, a special moment on the ground um, immediately after the final siren. But for Chris Scott to, to get this second flag on his CV, 11 years after his first one, 11 years after his first senior coach experience, and to receive the, the coach's medal off the great John Nichols there and to to get to now, it, it puts him into the, the very deserving elite country. Also, I, I think he was there anyway, but to fish, officially get to, it puts him there. But what was great, it was they identified where their shortcomings were from last year. They needed pace. They needed to inject some more players through the midfield. Close was amazing. You got Stengel. Atkins goes through the midfield. So they changed the structure and they took a punt onto Koning at centre-half back and yeah. continued to play. He played one game um, before uh, he started uh, the game. Chris Scott, he, he was a maestro. Yeah, it's a long time between drinks, but in between that, he's the best home and away record of all coaches. So uh, I was pumped by him. And we even yesterday. on Thursday night on our uh, telethon show, we asked him, and he said, unless he is 100% fit, mm. Max Holmes, yeah. we're not yeah. playing. Max Holmes passed every test, but Chris says, no, what, you're not playing. So he even made great mm. decisions during the week. And I don't think if he won that second premiership, we would have spoken of him like we, we should have. Mm. So I'm absolutely wrapped for him, TJ. And the, and the times I did see Max Holmes on the coverage, um, didn't he handle himself yeah, with yeah, distinction? Terrific. You know, there's a young man who just had his football dream shattered only 24 hours earlier, if not less than that. And he just handled himself with absolute dignity, that young Speaking man. And people handling themselves. Um, all the speeches yesterday, I thought, after the game were amazing. Even well, Dane Rampey's oh, speech. Oh, he was great, wasn't it? Sydney yeah. was terrific. Rampey, Salad, that was yeah, class. That, that was really good. Uh, yeah. Patrick Dangerfield, he was second in the Norm Smith medal voting and his prelim was unbelievable and his grand final Standard. I think was even better. So you just you saw a will, so every time you thought to yourself, can Sydney mount a challenge? But Dangerfield wasn't going to let this happen. Just his attack and his intent on the contest was unbelievable. Unbelievable. He's been doing it a long, long time, but his will and want to get this team over the line was just sensational. Well, the, the, the toils that he's had, and, and, and his body has at times um, hindered him, but he's always pushed through. The fact they gave him that now celebrated big yeah. chunk of time off, and then to have him hit the prelim final as hard as he did, and then equally as hard in the grand final, at yeah. the age he's at, and he's one of ten players at this club now who played yesterday, who are over that that once considered end age, that being 30. You've also got another one there at, at 29 on that list. There were two 34-year-olds, a 33-year-old Norm Smith medal winning player. It, it just defies what a lot of list managers, TJ, have been telling clubs that they need to do. This was the oldest team ever assembled on That's an army. AFL VFL venue by some years, by yeah. a couple of years. And yeah. it's in the 28s as an average. It's just an extraordinary effort. And, and I love it because it's just an endorsement of you don't need to start retiring players when they hit 30. I think one of the great things the AFL is the medal presentation and how the kids get involved. Lifelong memories for the kids. And Tommy Stewart got up yesterday and he was very excited, Tommy Stewart. So he obviously forgot that uh, he was going to shake hands and then the hat came off. He was very happy. But everybody, for those kids, lifelong moments. And I thought even Joel Selwood at the end when he had his young uh, kid and, and he got face on with the camera, um, everybody on that stage yesterday did a great job. Yeah, they certainly did. Um, now, Kane. It is. I know it's been a big couple of weeks for you, but it is grand final yes, surely weekend. Not. Surely, right? not surely, surely not today. you. I know you haven't had a rest, but surely you'll give the volcano a rest. Volcano is not having a rest. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> TJ, because when you lose the grand final by 81 points, can we get to the volcano? I wouldn't feel the same if we don't play the little, <laughs> the little lava. There it is. Yeah. That, that's the play that. When you lose a grand final by that margin, there's going to be some significant fallout from it, and. A, f a few weeks ago on this show, we did a volcano just to, to rehash. I don't think you risk players just because they have a big name, because in the end, Dustin Martin was a liability for uh, Richmond on uh, Thursday night.
I love it when someone throws the right so, gear. Yeah. This is great. You've got to keep your receipts. So they played, they played Sam Reid yesterday. They shouldn't have played Sam uh, Reid. He did not have a kick of the football. Clearly injured. And he, he, he was just hampered right from the start, really. He had four handballs for the game. By halfway through the second quarter, he was done. You look at the time there. He, he's done. He's speaking to the uh, medicos, and they're trying to get him off the ground. And at half time, he's essentially subbed out. The same with, with McInerney as well, who had the ankle injury talking to the medicos throughout the game, right throughout the game, and it's a distraction. So they got that wrong, and the contrast with how Geelong handled Holmes and Sydney handled Reid um, was there for They've a They've got it wrong seat. before as well in the 2016 grand final with Mills yeah. that day. Callum Mills had a hamstring. It was his first season of footy, the rising star of that year, and that, he took a bad hamstring into that game. And they didn't learn their lessons because they did it again yesterday. And after the game, Damo, I think they said as such, didn't they? Yeah, they did. And we'll get to that in, in a few moments' time when we reflect on what John Longline says. And on the flip side of that, Kane, I'm 100% with you. They made the wrong call. Uh, Max Holmes passed every test. <laughs> Uh, they kept thinking he'd fail a test and he kept passing. Well, you see the person he's speaking to there yeah. in the glasses, Steve Saunders, yeah. a, an internationally renowned um, sports scientist, basically. He, he, after the game, said he got him through the, yeah. the full fitness test and, and declared him right to go, but it was Chris Scott's brave call to, to take him out. But he said he got him through. Yeah, so. amazing. So, again, made the right call. Uh, Max Holmes might be thinking, OK, I could have played in that game. I could have even been the sub. I could have come on, played the last quarter, but you can't take a risk like that. And Parfit may well be yeah, he had eight, he was brilliant, wasn't he? Mm. Eight touches, kicked the goal when it was all over. So, yeah, good call from Geelong. But TJ, all the carnage was in the first quarter. So I'm going to show you the first 15 seconds. And there was a moment where I thought the Cats are on and the Sydney Swans weren't. And then the other boys will take over. So the ball comes out here. Zach Tui he is nowhere near as quick as Isaac Heaney. This is the first 15 seconds. How Zach Tui wins this ball when he starts from behind him on the wing. He gets the football. Isaac Heaney doesn't close him down. He gets it into Tom Hawkins. Doesn't kick a goal, Tom Hawkins. But I just thought it was a highlight of the first quarter that Zach Tui was able to get ahead of Isaac Heaney when he didn't, doesn't have that pace. Brownie, thank you. Uh, six goals, four to two points it was at half-time in terms of clearances. I want to take a look at the centre bounce mauling of Geelong versus Sydney. So I'll start with this. This is the first centre bounce. Dangerfield v Luke Parker. What's the size and the power? I didn't think Parker was strong enough here. So let this one roll. Too easy. So Danger wins the first clearance of the match. It was symbolic. The next one. Let's take a look at it. Hayden McLean, you're bought in. You're a big boy. Stick this tackle. Watch what happens, McLean. Not tough enough. Not strong enough. The next one. Goes in board, Dangerfield, who wants it more? Tommy Papley, no, you've been taught a lesson on how to play big midfield minutes. Dangerfield, too big, too strong, too tough. What does it lead to? Isaac Smith, Goulden, are you strong enough? No, you're not. Isaac Smith breaks his way through, kicks the goal. This just keeps going on. The next clearance, Dangerfield. Luke Parker, he's just launched and won the last clearance. Why didn't you stop this? OK, Isaac Heaney, you haven't had a kick yet in the game. We'll get you into the midfield. Can you front up against Mark Blixarves? No, you're not strong enough. You're not tough enough either. Too easy by Mark Blixarves, who sets up a big goal. So this was embarrassing for Sydney. Geelong were awesome, the last one. Tommy Papley v Dangerfield. OK, who wants it more? Yeah, Tommy loses his feet. Danger doesn't lose his feet. And watch what happens here. Dangerfield launches another one inside 50. Masterclass from Geelong. Sydney were embarrassing. Yeah, outstanding, Auto. And to pick up on that theme, let's take a look at some of the numbers in the first quarter because it was an absolute first quarter mauling from Geelong. Sydney just could not get their hands on the football. Look at the red there. Contested possession. They couldn't control the footy. 20 inside 50s to 8. And Tom Hickey was disgraceful yesterday, let's be honest. Tom Hawkins is a forward ruck. We all know what Tom Hawkins is trying to do. He's trying to grab the ball out of the ruck. We all know it, and a big renowned ruckman couldn't handle it. This is the first one against Blixar's, not even a ruckman. Tom Hickey lets him grab that. Again here, first goal of the game. Hickey, uncompetitive in the ruck against a forward ruckman. And then once again, you would not believe it that Tom Hawkins kicked two goals out of the ruck against a renowned ruckman like Tom Hickey. So he'd be quite embarrassed by that performance this morning.